know, today it's, it's special because um, not only do I see us celebrate extension and engagement and all of our outreach activities, but I know that coming on with me now is someone who's deeply committed to this. Um, I first met Moon Choi. I first saw him. Let me change that. I first saw him when he was introduced in Jeff City as a new president, incoming president in the fall of, I guess it was 2016. And uh, he would later start around March 1 of 2020. And I remember uh, uh, seeing him and then getting to know him a little bit. And as I said earlier, I can recall very well, we had this idea about broadband. And he called me and he said, um, he said, why don't you come over to the house and we'll talk about it. And I thought, okay. And he said, what are you doing Saturday morning? And I said, well, I guess I'm going to your house. So uh, that was unique. Uh, I had not ever had that experience. Uh, but uh, it has been not only a joy of mine to work for him in terms of reporting lines, but to really learn from him. Uh, Dr. Choi brings not only a tremendous background academically, working in various places, most recently before he came here as provost at the University of Connecticut, but he really brings a sense of understanding of people's lives. You know, he's told me many times, and when we've been together, uh, about his journey here to this country and what it means to him to be in this country. Uh, it is a great story. I don't know if he wants to tell that today or not or share any of that, but it is truly meaningful to see him interact, be with Missourians the way he does, because it's not a show, it's heartfelt. He deeply cares about people's lives, and that's why I think probably this Marshall Stewart Moon Choi thing works, is because at the end of the day, we care about the same things. We care about people. We want people's lives to be better. So I give you today not only somebody who's deeply committed to us being an AAU institution, Research One institution. I give you today somebody who not only requires and expects faculty to do great teaching, because he does, but he also is deeply committed to engagement and ensuring that we serve in the way we should as a university and as a university system. With that, I give you Dr. Moon Choi. Thank you, Marshall. It's uh, great to be with everyone today, albeit virtually. But I enjoy these opportunities to uh, engage with all of you. And it's really a special time because you have done such great work during the past six months and throughout the year. And we're going to count on you because Missourians count on you. Now, as the president of the University of Missouri system, I lead 75,000 students and almost 25,000 faculty and staff. Now, it's important to recognize that those are our constituents, our core constituents. But I also recognize that our core constituents also include the six million Missourians that actually are very proud of what we do at the university. And many of the six million people, six million Missourians that rely on us, get their connection, get their insights about what we do through your work, through extension. And that's why it's so important. So today and tomorrow when I visit again, I'm going to be speaking about what extension means to me and why I'm so proud, so proud of the work that you do. So let me advance my slide and start with the importance of how transcendent extension is to all of us. And whether it is uh, the words of uh, our president, Jesse, whose words are inscribed in a monument just outside of Jesse Hall, the work of the university through extension, which has been so critical to this university for over 150 years, it has to go on and has to go on and meet the needs of Missourians. In terms of your specific work, I'm so proud of the way that you've stepped up. I, ass I assume that many of you have felt the stresses, the pressures of dealing with the pandemic, the financial crisis, and racial matters. But you gave above and beyond yourself to be able to help those who are in need. And some of our instructors went through the exercise of converting all of their courses so that they can be delivered virtually. And that happened throughout the university and extension led the way to ensure that our 4-H students had that engagement, especially during a time when they could not attend classes. And we also recognize that during these periods, many of our young uh, partners also undergo some 
severe uh, counseling uh, issues and so forth. So we're very proud of the work that you did. Our students and faculty members also participated in programs like troops that support, or tigers that support troops. As part of that exercise, we have remote vans that go throughout the state of Missouri working with veterans so that they get the support that they need and get the benefits that they are entitled to. We also have many of our students through 4-H working with local food pantries so that hungry Missourians can be fed, especially during periods when food becomes scarce, especially with the economy turning down. So we're very proud of all that they do. Now, as Marsha was mentioned previously, the work that you've done to identify the three key areas are so aligned to what we do as the public land-grant AAU Research University, we are also focused on education, which leads to student success, the economy, not only through the workforce development, but the opportunities for our faculty members to develop new technologies, new processes that will make Missouri more competitive, and obviously health. And so these three very important critical areas are aligned with Extension and the university. And it is our job, despite the challenges that we face, to continue to make advancements in this regard. More recently, many of our students from the School of Business, the True Last School of Business, worked with constituents throughout the state. The uh, SBDC that is being led by Extension received more than $71 million in support to help small businesses transition, weather this uh, pandemic and the financial crisis. And they went throughout the state. And you see a picture here of some of our business students working with constituents in St. Joseph, Missouri. But these stories were told throughout, throughout the state of Missouri. And the infrastructure that was developed as part of this will be ready for the next pandemic or next issue that requires our students to engage more with Missouri residents. And during these exercises, our students gained a greater understanding of the challenges faced by Missourians. And at the same time, Missourians learned about the commitment of our students and the selfless acts that they provide by volunteering in programs like this to help others. Another very important program for all of us is the ECHO program. And in the ECHO program, which is led by Dr. Karen Edison, expert, medical experts from throughout the state of Missouri provide online, online trainings to primary care providers throughout, especially in rural parts of the state. In some rural parts of the state, there may not be uh, specialists like dermatologists or oncologists. So to be able to train primary care providers to identify and also treat these diseases provides access to those who currently don't have that access. And this is becoming more and more important during a pandemic. Because of the shelter in place requirements, many of our doctors in the state of Missouri, not just at the University of Missouri, provided telemedicine services. And according to our CEO of the hospital, prior to COVID, perhaps we were doing about 500 telemedicine visits in a year, but there were times when they had over a thousand per day. So this is a new way for us to deliver healthcare to those who need it, especially in areas where there are disparities. As Marshall stated earlier, to be able to deliver this kind of service requires broadband. That's why I'm so proud of the work that Marshall and his teammates, his team members, are contributing to bring more broadband to rural parts of the state. And speaking of healthcare, our most important investment for the next 20 to 30 years for both our academics, research, and engagement is NextGen Precision Health. This project is now being led by Dr. Rick Barron, who serves as the Executive Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. But as you can see from the 
columns, the six columns of excellence that we are trying to pursue. The foundation is built on the four universities, the UM system, MU Healthcare, but just as importantly, MU Extension. Through MU Extension, we want to engage the rural population, metropolitan population, and provide healthcare using precision approaches to those that have currently disparities in healthcare, education, and the economy. And to give you a sense of what the impact of this work will be, consider that currently the University of Missouri is the holder of four patents for radiopharmaceutical medicines to treat cancer. We're the only university that is able to do that kind of work. And together with Extension, we want to make sure that the developments in cancer medicine, in neurological diseases, cardiovascular diseases, are provided, translated to all parts of the state, regardless of the zip code in which they live. So we're very excited about this, and you'll hear more about the developments from Marshall, me, and uh, Dr. Rick Barron. This is my favorite slide, where I get to tell some stories about the important work. And I wish I could have all of your pictures on here, but these represent all of you. And let me start with uh, Taranjo Tsethi, who works in Northwest uh, Missouri and her work in providing educational as well as outreach programs to better understand how COVID is transmitted and mitigated has been key to residents in that part of the state. Chelsea Corkins and Blake Gazaway are 4-H specialists. When we had to have shelter in place in many counties in the state, they quickly converted all of their courses within two days to deliver it virtually. That took an incredible amount of work, but their stories also represent what you have done, what you have done in your own communities. Maria Rodriguez Alcala from Southwest Missouri has been working with the Tiger for Troops programs to ensure that those who live in Nixa, in Springfield, and other parts of Southwest Missouri are provided with the support from our law students as well as law faculty to get the benefits that they are entitled to for serving their country with great distinction. On the northwest or northeast part of the state near Hannibal and Palmyra is Carisha Devlin. And during this past year, she led a very important women's summit called Family, Farm, and Me. And through that program, she provided very important, important outreach and educational programs for families that are currently suffering from stress because of the pandemic and the financial crisis. And they recognize that women play such an important role in the operation of the, of the family farm that she focused her attention to supporting those women. So proud of Carisha. Rusty Lee has been throughout the state with his uh, plant, uh, uh, plant group to make sure that all of our, all of our specialists are trained in the areas in which family farms can be sustained despite the, f the floods or droughts that we may be facing. Last but not least is Juan Cabrera, Cabrera Garcia from southeast part of the state. And he has developed an all Spanish version of how to survive COVID and how to have master gardening excellence in any part of the state but more importantly, any part of the world. In fact, we heard from participants from Ecuador that said that his delivery of his courses reached 8,000 people in Ecuador. So not only are you making a difference in the state of Missouri, but you're making a difference to different parts of the world that elevates our stature and the impact of your work. Now I come to a very special time, and uh, I don't know if the camera can focus on Marshall for a little bit to see the big smile that he has. By the way, many of you may think that Mark Stewart is related to Marshall Stewart, but they're not related, but they have the same commitment to service, same commitment of being a servant leader. And after 
40 years, Mark has decided to retire. He's going to retire to do the things that he enjoys doing, like fishing, spending time with his family on his farm, but also contributing, continuing to contribute to his own community and the state. And as you can see from there, he began as a livestock specialist and a regional director and became director of all campus operation in 2016. He was instrumental in implementing the CES model with Marshall. Marshall had the big vision, but also at the same time, Mark Stewart came up with ways to implement and operationalize it and work with the communities so that this implementation went smoothly as possible. He served as interim associate vice chancellor on two separate occasions. Sometimes the interim jobs are thankless jobs, but he did it with grace and always a smile on his face. He does live extension, and we're going to miss him because we won't be able to see him each and every day, but we know that no matter where he is in the state, he's going to be contributing to the mission of extension. So, Mark, if you're there, please stand so we can recognize you. Now I come to my last slide, and this is a program that Marshall Stewart and his team has, has, uh, have developed. And uh, it is uh, led by Allison Copeland, as well as Ashley Rohde. And we select the most outstanding faculty members from the four universities, individuals who will go to different parts of the state and bring the news about their work, whether it's in teaching, research or engagement, so that we can demonstrate to Missourians the value that we provide. I ask all of our constituents, whether it's faculty, students, or staff, to ask whether their focus and their investments will bring benefits to Missouri citizens who pay taxes to support the university, as well as to students and parents who pay tuition. And we have to be grounded grounded in knowing that we are serving the needs of those supporters, and that's critical. So just a few examples. Professor Jamila Jefferson Jones is from UMKC, and she is a faculty of law. And she does incredible work on understanding, understanding property law, as well as disparities, disparities in property acquisition. And Professor Kathleen Preble, is a professor of social work at Mizzou. And as a social worker, she has a deep commitment to ensuring that each and every citizen that lives in the state of Missouri is provided with opportunities for success. And in many ways, social work is really the fabric that, con that connects the university to the social needs that we have in the state. Last but not least is Guirong Grace Yan. And she is from Missouri s and and she's a professor of civil engineering. And she does incredible work understanding how buildings can withstand heavy winds. And more and more with changes that we're seeing in our weather patterns, that uh, ability for buildings to withstand heavy winds due to tornadoes as well as hurricanes are going to be more and more important. So for them to share their stories and at the same time hear about your perspectives, your concerns, and your aspirations will make us a stronger university. So let me end with this, uh, with this video. In fact, if I can ask you to roll it. Picture yourself in a post-pandemic world. Will you still wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands for an entire 20 seconds, Will you still go out of your way to help others, find solutions, and make a difference in a million little ways? Will you inspire people and lead with compassion, determination, imagination, and with grit? Will you continue to build on more than 180 years of education, impact, and service? Will you rest on your reputation as a research, public, flagship, land-grant, comprehensive AAU institution and be satisfied with what you've accomplished? 
where you are and where you've been? Or will you look forward to find new paths, to make new friendships, working together to discover the next big idea? Picture yourself as you continue to change your world. Can you see it? Now is the time. Now is your time. Show me. Thank you. Um, as that video showed, our university has been very resilient. We've had some significant uh, concerns earlier in the year with COVID, but with social distancing and masking and all of the precautions that we've implemented at the university, all universities that are part of the system are managing COVID very effectively. So thank you for this opportunity to be here and let me now turn it back over to Marshall Stewart. Thank you, Dr. Choi, and we're gonna keep you on the set with us for a few minutes. Uh, you know, I think about what you talked about and you've talked about the importance of partnerships in different ways across the university. You've touched on that. You've talked about the importance of service to the people of Missouri and you've highlighted some of our great faculty that definitely, and as you said, we could tell that story 200 more times because they're all doing unique and powerful things. Uh, but you also uh, really get down to the heart of it, that, and especially in this last piece where the campus obviously has gone through a tremendous shift in terms of masking and social distancing, and we really took the approach that all of us have it, and we need to protect one another. And I think as you probably know, we, we aligned everything we do in extension with the university. So when the university said we're going virtual, we went virtual for a while, then we backed up and we shifted back to face-to-face -to -face as best we could where we could. When the university said mask up, we masked up. And as you probably can imagine, there have been people in our university uh, employment, uh, faculty, staff across the state that sometimes don't necessarily, are, that's not welcomed. Uh, I'd like for you to talk about that because I know you know, you feel that for our people, not only on the campus, but we think of the campus as a whole state. What, any reflections on that as, as they sit there right now today, maybe having to deal with that? Absolutely. You know, uh, you mentioned earlier that I, I came from South Korea. And what I recognized when I came from South Korea to the United States, even at that young age, is the freedom that this country provides to its uh, citizens and inhabitants. And that's what makes this country great. Less restriction and more opportunities for independent choice. I think that's key. But I also recognize that during a pandemic, we have to consider the greater good, the greater good uh, that the policies that are recommended by medical experts provide for all of us. And we have gone with the approach, assume that everyone has it so that we can protect ourselves so we can better protect you. So when the, when the mask order first came out, I felt uncomfortable wearing a mask because that's not my normal part of a daily routine. But I also recognized that what I was doing is protecting those who may be more vulnerable than me. Perhaps uh, older uh, Missourians who have some underlying health issues. And so now wearing a mask has become routine and if I see individuals who don't have a mask, I will go up to them very politely and say, I care about your health. And I know you care about the health of all of your constituents. So may I ask you if you can put on a mask? And those conversations typically go well. And uh, the, uh, the person that I'm speaking to will say, well, thank you for being concerned about my health. I will put it on. And, uh, and I think this is something that we have to do to ensure that we manage the pandemic during this crisis. It's not easy, but it's necessary for us to manage it. We've talked a lot about in the community how our folks that work for the University of Missouri are really examples, role models. Mm -hmm. uh, people see them do it, they have high respect, uh, extensions respected in local communities, in particular rural areas uh, where you have a smaller population concentration perhaps, and certainly that role model piece. But you also tapped on something else, and I was wondering if you'd go there. You, you touched in, in your answer a little bit about your journey here. Yeah. And you know, you don't tell that a lot, <laughs> because it's just not, it's not, that's the, not the Moon Choi way, I get that. 
But I think it would be good to maybe share just a little bit about wh what brought you not only to the University of Missouri, but if you take it back as a young boy, I think people would be interested in knowing that transition that brought you to America because to me that really, when you know that, you understand Moon Joy. Sure. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. I'll try to get it in in about five minutes or less. Yeah. Uh, but I was born in South Korea in 1964, and South Korea was a country that was devastated uh, by the Japanese uh, occupation, as well as the World War II and the Korean War. And uh, I'm reminded, I'm reminded that the successes that I've had in life were really due to people that I met along the way as, long, as well as people that I'd never had a chance to meet, and they probably didn't realize what kind of contribution they would have in my life. And so I, I think about uh, Colonel, Colonel, Colonel Fry, Glenn Fry, who grew up, who grew up in Columbia, Missouri, and he was a captain, an air, uh, a Navy pilot. And as part of that uh, work, he was sent to Korea during the Korean War. He, lies, he lost his life there. And if you ask people who fought in the Korean War why they fought, they would say, it's because we had to contain communism. I don't think they ever thought that they were in some way providing opportunities for freedom and democracy in that small country. And that eventually, someone who will be born 10 years later would immigrate to the United States and become president of this great university system. But that person did. So I am reminded each and every day of people like Captain Fry. And there were 12 others from Boone County who lost their lives in the Korean War. And there were 964 Missourians that made the ultimate sacrifice in Korea. So I think about them and their contributions and their impact. And all of us, all of us, I believe, have risen to the success that we have in life because of the work of others. Of course, parents are critically important. Teachers are critically important. But at the same time, there are many people whose invisible hands have touched our lives. And it will do us good, it does me good, thinking about them and their contribution. Yeah, well, you know, Dr. Choi, I, I, I've known that about you and certainly got to know it. Um, a lot of our folks out there today, as you well know, have gone through a tremendous amount, not only work-wise, but also personally. And, and you know that because you and I talk a lot, and, and I do worry about our people. But if you sit there as, as a leader of the University of Missouri system and certainly the MU campus as chancellor, what do you say to people today to say, hey, yeah, it's tough, but we're going to get there? What, what, what is that message that you'd want them to feel today about what's out there in the future that it gives you a little hope that we're going to get there and we're going to be better? Right. Marshall, this is probably the most challenging time that I faced, that I faced in my life. And uh, I know that many of our students are undergoing some um, significant mental health issues because they can't socialize it like they used to. We have parents of students who, are, who may have lost a job and the prospect of finding another job is pretty dim at the moment. But these stories probably replicate themselves throughout the state of Missouri and the United States. All I can say to them is that for us to survive and perhaps even thrive in this challenging period is to be resilient, try to see the positives and the setbacks that we see, and to learn from them to prepare for the next challenges. Now, as dramatic as these challenges are, we could see that our ancestors, perhaps uh, your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents have suffered through significant challenges whether it's the Spanish flu or the uh, Great Depression or World War II when the entire world was at war, but they were able to make it through. 
And we talk about the greatest generation coming around the time of World War II and beyond. Why is it that they became the greatest generation? Circumstances had a role. But I, I do believe, in my own mind, that the resilience that was created in those individuals during the Great Depression helped to prepare them for World War II and beyond. So there are brighter days ahead. Think positively, be resilient, and be ready for the next challenge. Dr. Choi, I know we've got some questions that are coming in, so uh, we're going to take those. I think Megan's going to feed those to us, so um, we'll go to Megan and uh, get some questions here. Thank you both. Um, this, this question is addressed to both of you. Over the last several months, the university has had to work hard and be flexible to protect its core missions of education, research, and extension and outreach. What lessons have you learned that paved the way for continued growth and innovation for all of us? You want me to go first? Uh, well, he is, the, he is the chancellor and the president, so I will go first. So uh, I, I think uh, for me, it's been that, you know, you, you have choices in life. Uh, we all do. And you can either be defeated and be a victim, or you can be a victor. You can decide, hey, we're going to come through this thing. And I, I've been very grateful for me, for I sit as a vice chancellor and chief engagement officer, to be surrounded with really good people who share the same mission and values that they want to do the right things for Missourians. It, for me, it always comes back to that. That's, that's my world. That's where I sit. That's what I'm paid to do. And so I've learned that it's the what we will do will always be the same. How we go about it, it may look a little different. The how may have to change. And the example was, we saw it a few minutes ago in one of our award winners with 4-H. I mean, 4-H is something that certainly I had some involvement in a little bit growing up and then was state 4-H leader in North Carolina at one time. And I know 4-H. I've seen 4-H in this environment go into an orbit that they never thought they'd go into because they had to go virtual. It's, you know, 4-H is one of those things, it's historic, it's community-based clubs. It's one of those things, and, but I've seen them pivot and say, hey, we can reach thousands more. It'll be different, but what we do to change lives in a positive way is still gonna be the same. The what's the same, how you go about it. So for me as a leader, it's been trying to get myself, in, in an, an example, another example for me would be, you know, I, I'm, I'm one that loves to be out there with people. I love it. I mean, that's, that's my world. I can't do that in this environment because people, are, eyeballs are on me every day. <laughs> And I can't avoid, I can't make a mistake. So I've had to go to virtual a lot more. I've had to do that. I'm learning how to do it better. And so the how's there. What I'm doing is the same thing. How I'm doing it's different. So I'm having to deal with that. So for me, it's, it's, it's the how question. How do you do it in this environment? Great answer, Marshall. Well, I don't believe any leader, university leader or extension leader had a playbook of how to deal with the pandemic. And many of us, we're learning on the go. But it was very important for us to be flexible, not to double down on a plan that was developed with incomplete information, but to make changes, pivot as necessary. And what I really appreciated were stakeholders from the university, from beyond the university, who identified problems that they were seeing, but also they said to us, I'm willing to help. And, uh, and that really felt uh, uplifting to know that we're not in this alone, that there are people in the community, within the university and beyond the university who are willing to help us navigate the challenges that we faced in the pandemic, in the social justice matters, as well as financial crisis that accompanied it. So more to learn and more to pivot as uh, the situation warrants. Another question, Megan? Yeah, let's do one more. We've gotten several questions this morning. The ones that we don't get to, we'll find answers um, for folks and post those later. Um, this one is, uh, developing a 21st century workforce was a priority before the pandemic, uh, but now with issues such as online access to education being even more critical, what is the university doing to improve affordable broadband access and support other advancements that foster uh, workforce development? 
Well, I'll take the I'll take the first piece of that. I think I think the, the there's two pieces we've done in the broadband space that are really important. I really want to give Allison Copeland a lot of credit on this because uh, if if I don't have good people around me to do this work, it, I couldn't get the tangibles done. One of those is we have used the University of Missouri as a megaphone to ramp it up. Uh, when I got here, there was a lot of buzz around a uh, hum. I'll call it a hum <laughs> around broadband. We made it a buzz. We, we got it moved up, r we ratcheted it up, and we used the university as this megaphone to say, we can do better. We don't, we're not ones that are in the fiber business. We don't, well, that's not our, our space, but we realized that that is a barrier to our achieving what we could. So we became a megaphone, and we, we still will be. We will continue it. The other piece we've done, though, I think is equally important, is we've created this broadband resource rail, uh, based on community input and needs, we, we build it with community. Uh, we have uh, a project you know, down in Bollinger County, down in southeast Missouri going on right now, sort of a test project of how communities can change this uh, challenge and, and deal with this challenge. So I think for us as a university, it's about using those resources to test out and try new things and make resources available, be an educational piece for people how to use broadband, et cetera. But again, it's both of those. It's the megaphone and it's the educational resource. Dr. Joy? Well, I, I believe that um, the access to broadband is going to be so key because with the lessons that we learned during this pandemic, more and more people are going to be willing to use the virtual model to complement the in-person education. There are some aspects of uh, education that just cannot be replicated virtually. But those that can, I believe we're going to be pursuing and students will be demanding. And so we have to change our business model going forward. But broadband can also occur in ways that jump technology. Mm -hmm. So right now, broadband that's being provided usually comes in through fiber optics. But just yesterday, SpaceX announced a satellite delivery of broadband, which doesn't require wires which means that it can be accessible anywhere in the world. So we need to be thinking about those types of technology jumps that will bypass traditional accepted technology, in many ways, questioning the status quo to get us there. And if we can, then we'll be able to deliver not only the education, but also healthcare and economic opportunity to different parts of the state that much better than we are doing right now. Well, Dr. Choi, I want to thank you. Uh, it's been a joy to have you over here and be with us, and uh, thank you for taking time to do it. I know you got a lot on you, but uh, you made it a priority, and we're going to have you back tomorrow. So you be tomorrow. back with us tomorrow and our work on, as we specifically double down on this workforce development issue. So again, thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure. If we were in a live audience, they'd be on their feet right now applauding. So uh, maybe applauding you. They'd be applauding you. No, you're, you're the one. So we appreciate, and I do want to say that again. I appreciate so much the support and the the leadership and, and being that person who allows us to do what we do because uh, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you again.